welcome to the official launch of Privacy Awareness Week in Queensland for 2016. I would like to begin by respectfully acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this event is taking place and their elders, both past and present, and emerging community leaders. Thank you all for attending this morning to share in the special event. I would like to welcome and thank in particular the Attorney General and Minister for Justice and Minister for Training and Skills, who will speak shortly. I'm also pleased to see leaders and members of a range of Queensland Government agencies and stakeholders here today, including Queensland Government departments, local government, universities and public authorities, the private legal sector, media and key organisations such as the International Association of Privacy Professionals Australia and New Zealand and the Open Data Institute Queensland. In particular, I would like to acknowledge that a number of leaders and representatives from oversight bodies that support a strong accountability and integrity framework in Queensland are with us today. Privacy Awareness Week is an annual event within the Asia Pacific region that promotes a culture that protects and respects the privacy of individuals' personal information and to more generally raise privacy awareness. The statutory functions of the Information Commissioner include raising awareness about privacy and assisting government agencies to comply with the privacy principles under the Information Privacy Act. This year, the Asia-Pacific Authority, Privacy Authority's theme is Privacy in Your Hands, and we have made a range of resources available. Thank you for your adoption of Privacy Awareness Week within your agencies, as the success of this week in raising awareness is reliant on the partnership and cooperation we have enjoyed over the past several years for both this week and Right to Information Week. We are increasingly aware of community expectations about privacy and the impact on trust and reputation if an individual shares personal information with an organisation that does not protect or respect privacy. Trust in government has shown, been shown to be lower in recent years and incidents that shake the community's confidence or trust in how a public sector organisation will deal with their personal information will no doubt have an impact on how they trust government agencies and cause reputational damage. The impact on an individual can also be devastating. Loss of personal data can be shared effortlessly and quickly with the ease of technology and the damage can be irreversible. Consequences arising from unauthorised or inappropriate sharing of confidential information can be significant and affect people in, in critical ways. And we've seen the consequences of some of that in our privacy complaints work. Government agencies hold, and with emerging technology, have the potential to collect a range of personal information about the community. We need to ensure that as we explore opportunities to embrace new technology, to achieve greater efficiencies, be more effective and provide better service delivery, we consider the potential implications and risks, including for privacy, and build in appropriate options to address any issues. While it may be relatively common, closed circuit camera surveillance is one technology that continues to be an issue for many agencies in relation to privacy and access. CCTV is well used by Queensland government agencies, with over 32,000 cameras in place across Queensland in 2015, and body-worn cameras and drones increasingly being used for a range of purposes. However, while CCTV would not be considered new technology, and clear guidance and expectations about access and privacy have been available for a number of years, our follow-up performance monitoring report to Parliament in 2015 found that greater progress must be made in key areas to meet privacy obligations, including data security and access to personal information. It has been apparent that CCTV has been adopted by some agencies without much thought to the ongoing consequences of its collection and storage, and some agencies continue to therefore be in a vulnerable position to manage potential risks associated with such an approach. My concern is that with the rapid pace of technological development and adoption by agencies, it is important for agencies to place sufficient importance on how they will collect, store, manage, provide access to and securely dispose of personal information at the outset of considering such new technology to avoid privacy breaches and other adverse outcomes through appropriate consideration and management of issues. 
which can be done. I look forward to hearing from our guest speaker, Ms Shara Evans, in our keynote presentation today about future technologies and considerations for their adoption by government. It is an exciting and timely topic to explore. I think we would all agree that when we think about technology, what we consider to be the future today very quickly becomes part of our everyday reality and difficult to remember operating without. I'm very pleased to introduce to speak first this morning the Attorney General and Minister for Justice and Minister for Training and Skills, the Member for Redcliffe, Yvette Darth. The Attorney General and Minister for Justice and Minister for Training and Skills was appointed in February 2015. Prior to entering the Queensland Government, the Attorney General served as a Member for Petrie in the Federal Parliament and worked as an industrial advocate. The Attorney General includes within her portfolio ministerial responsibility for the Information Privacy Act and the Right to Information Act. Please join with me in welcoming the Attorney General, Minister for Justice and Minister for Training Skills. Thank you very much, Rachel, and good morning, everybody. I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which we hold this forum this morning and pay my respects to the elders past and present. If you can bear with me, I have a very long list of acknowledgements. Um, can I acknowledge uh, your MC here today, Rachel Rangieda, Information Commissioner, uh, Philip Green, Privacy Commissioner, uh, Shara Evans, your keynote speaker, uh, Queensland Government Ministers, members of the Parliamentary Committees, Directors General, uh, CEOs of statutory bodies, including Kevin Cox, AM Anti-Discrimination Commissioner, Alan McSpohan, QC, Chair of the Crime and Corruption Commission, Walter Vandermeer, Electoral Commissioner, uh, Dr Jeff Garrett, AO, Ch Chief Scientist, uh, Phil Clark, Queensland Ombudsman, QUT for hosting this breakfast, and Dr Monique Mann of QUT Faculty of Law, Dean of Griffith Law School, Professor Bel uh, Penelope Matthew and Senior Academics, and staff of the Office of the Information Commissioner, and especially uh, a acknowledgement to Mr Steve Haig and to everyone else who is here tonight, this morning. I, I was just joking that I think it's the longest acknowledgement um, list I've ever had considering it's a privacy uh, week event. So, um, <laughs> but it is important to acknowledge just the diversity we've got in the room and it just shows the importance of the topic um, and, uh, and how relevant it is uh, today to be having this discussion. I'm certainly pleased and honoured to be invited to attend the official launch of the Privacy Awareness Week in Queensland for 2016. Privacy Awareness Week is an initiative started by the Asia-Pacific Privacy Authorities back in 2006, which has been held every year since. The Privacy uh, Awareness Week has a very important purpose to promote and to raise awareness for privacy issues and the importance of protecting per personal information. And I want to thank um, the Office of the Information Commissioner and uh, the Privacy Commissioner. I have been online. I've had a look at all of the information uh, for Privacy Week and there is a huge range of useful tools and information there for, uh, for people. And I, I even did the little uh, quiz uh, which was quite interesting and uh, I won't quiz the room as to which password you thought was the most common as far as uh, Star Wars, password or 123456. Um, but uh, they were all in the top 25 in 2015 apparently. So uh, maybe that means we've learnt nothing when it comes to privacy. Um, look, the Privacy Awareness Week events are being held all over the region and the Asia-Pacific Privacy Authority's members, including the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner and our, and our own Office of the Information Commissioner, are holding a range of events. It is wonderful to see that privacy is being championed across Queensland, Australia and the Asia-Pacific region. To quote the Commonwealth Privacy Commissioner, privacy is an international conversation these days. We all know that information flows are more frequent and more complex than in the past. And in a digital age, unconstrained by borders, I congratulate the international regulators for working together in this way. This year's theme for Privacy Awareness Week is privacy in your hands. The message is that we all need to understand both our rights and our responsibilities in relation to how we handle personal information 
including our own personal information. Individuals, businesses, the community and government all have a role to play in this important area. As individuals, we need to consider how we disclose our personal information to others, including the use of social media, such as Facebook. We are constantly being asked to provide our details, so we need to be aware of its value and the importance of protecting it. And Rachel and I were just having a, a discussion before we started that uh, there is still, and if not growing, um, anxiety about governments having so much information and people still being uh, nervous about wanting to pass on information to government agencies because they're not sure about the security of that information. Yet at a personal level, we have not seen so much information being voluntarily shared with the general public. Uh, and as a parent, uh, I have to say, I'm not one who shares a lot on social media about my personal life, um, but I am amazed. I'm amazed at how many um, parents put so much information about their own children and their names and their pictures and their age and where they go to school. Uh, and as someone who uh, has a real dilemma in their own household, I am a member of parliament, which means everything about my life is supposed to be known uh, and shared. And I have no right to privacy in the eyes of the general public. Uh, and also being married to a police officer who is taught from day one to keep as much information about their personal life private for their own security and the security of their family. So you can imagine the challenge in our household of, well, no, don't put that out there because that will identify us and uh, at the same time it's where do you live and what do you do and, you know, how old are your kids and where they go to school and so it is a real challenge and it's a, a challenge we all have to face and with technology now, and I'll be so interested in hearing the, you know, the address later, that how do we keep up and how do we protect privacy and what does privacy mean? You know, in the current age, with um, so much information being shared in social media. It's a conversation we have to have and it's an issue we have to tackle. As I said, as parents, we need to consider how our children interact with others online. Luckily, there is plenty of guidance on this topic these days, provided by the Commonwealth Office of the Children's eSafety Commissioner. As Ministers of the Crown and as public servants, we need to ensure that we are collecting, using, storing and disclosing personal information in ways that are consistent with the Information Privacy Act of 2009. We need to ensure that privacy is considered at the beginning of projects, as Rachel said, that might require us to share information, not tacked onto them, retrofitted at the end. To ensure governments can take up the amazing opportunities that emerging technologies provide, we need to think about the privacy implications of the initiatives we adopt and plan for privacy by design. Government in 2016 is complex. It is important that governments at all levels strike the right balance between public safety, service delivery and ensuring transparency and accountability. With my responsibility for the Right to Information Act as well as the Information Privacy Act, I'm keenly aware of the essential role that information management and the privacy and security of personal information plays in creating and maintaining the community's trust in government. If agencies understand that the community values privacy, they will tend to thrive and achieve success. Customers will vote with their fingers and increasingly adopt online services and mobile technologies, increasing the efficiency and effectiveness of government services. And we should never underestimate how willing our seniors are now wanting to get online. And I know as a federal member when we launched the, uh, the Centrelink app for pensioners so that they could go online, put all the information, they won't need to ring in, they won't need to go to a Centrelink office, they can just hit the app and they'll know what that payment was for, whether their payment's gone in, they can put their latest detail, take a phone, a, a picture with their smartphone, upload it onto their own file. And you would think there would have been some hesitation, but I could not believe how many turned up with their walkers uh, and their smartphone and their iPads and everything tucked into their little walker and they got it out and they sat there and they lined up for an hour to register to get this app. Uh, and some turned up with the old little Nokia phone and said, look, we know this can't do anything, but I'm about to get a new phone and I came along to find out what type of phone I need to get access to this information. We need to help them through this and get them to understand once they are online how they can protect their privacy. 
Governments today is frequently required to balance rights to privacy with other fundamental interests, such as the right of security in an era of heightened threat. With expert advice, I believe we can get the balance right. I'm confident that we will be, uh, we'll be capable hands in navigating how these rights are balanced. I'm reassured by the presence of Mr Philip Green as Privacy Commissioner. I value what he brings to the role. You may be aware that Mr Green was permanently appointed to this position in 2015 after a long vacancy in uh, the Privacy Commissioner's role. After a national advertising process which commenced not long after we came into government, I was very pleased to appoint Mr Green to the role. With a Masters in Law, majoring in Technology Law, including privacy, regulation of the internet and the media, I believe Philip is exactly what we needed. He appears to be doing a great job in navigating between privacy and new technology, leading OIC's resolution of privacy complaints and monitoring and enforcing agency compliance with the IP Act. The role will no doubt have its challenges. The pace of technology advancement means that government policies, procedures and legislation may have trouble keeping pace with these developments. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Rachel, the Information Commissioner, for the incredible work she and her staff do in assisting government and the community in understanding how the RTI Act and the IP Act operate. A look at the OIC's website will show what a productive organisation the OIC is. There is a wealth of information available, in addition to the enormous resources to guide agencies and the public in relation to right to information applications. There are guidelines on the use and disclosure of personal information, dealing with third party service providers, cloud computing and many others. One of my favourite documents is called Top 10 Privacy Myths Busted. One myth identified as the privacy stops government information flow. You can't tell anyone anything. Of course, this is not correct. The IP Act provides for the fair handling of personal information and allows appropriate information flow. It reflects the pragmatic line which the OIC takes, championing privacy but acknowledging that it exists in a complex world where government must provide services and protect community safety. The degree of stability in both the Commonwealth and the Queensland Government now with our Office of Information Commissioners, we are hopeful um, that we're in a good place in relation to privacy and in a position to have this important debate. We may be aware, or you may be aware, that the RTI Act requires a strategic review of the OIC to be conducted. And I'm pleased to announce that this government is taking steps to have this review commenced. My intention is for the Governor and Council to shortly consider the appointment of a suitably qualified independent reviewer. The reviewer will consult with the OIC and look at the Information Commissioner's functions, how the Commissioner performs those functions, to see whether they are being performed economically, effectively and efficiently. A report of the review will be tabled in Parliament as soon as possible after the review is completed. And I look forward to considering the outcome of the review and assessing whether any legislative changes are required. On the topic of legislative change, the RTI Act also requires a review of the RTI Act and the IP Act. This is something which the previous government commenced and I'm committed to continuing with and ensuring full and proper consultation in relation to the review. The Director General of the Department of Justice and Attorney General has asked his equivalent sort of from a number of departments and Rachel as Information Commissioner to nominate representatives for a steering committee for the review of these acts. So I'd ask everyone to put their thinking caps on. I believe that the RTI and the IP Acts have worked well over time, but no doubt improvements can be made given how life and technology has moved on since 2009. I will provide more information at a later date, but I am committed to this review being thorough and to make both our RTI Act and IP Act as relevant and contemporary as can be. Public consultation and debate on these issues is critical. It is great to have Ms Shara Evans here to present the keynote address. Shah, who is a technology futurist, will assist us with the important debate, prompting us to consider the issues involved and arrive at the correct balance. Improved service delivery and innovation are critical, but we need to be aware of and respectful of privacy issues too. In conclusion, I'd like to thank you again for the opportunity to speak at this important event. To remind you that in all the roles we adopt as individuals, ministers, workers, public servants, parents and regulators, privacy is indeed in our hands. Thank you and enjoy the this morning. Thank you, Attorney General, for your insightful comments, reinforcing the importance of the theme, Privacy in Your Hands, this Privacy Awareness Week. 
and the essential role that information management and privacy and security information plays in creating and maintaining trust in the community. The opportunities that emerging technologies offer, including those associated with initiatives such as Advanced Queensland, which has been recently discussed in innovation, um, are exciting and bring important issues for consideration that we must ensure we address appropriately to deliver effectively. Thank you also for your kind words about our office. Um, and I must assure you that myth busting is something that we do uh, almost on a daily basis and uh, is an important part of our activities to help support agencies to continue to deliver the, on their business. Because often privacy is seen as a barrier when in fact it really isn't. And uh, there are workarounds that can be privacy respectful as well. Please join with me in thanking the Attorney Generals. I'm pleased to introduce to you this morning the Queensland Privacy Commissioner, Mr Philip Green. As the Attorney General said, Philip was appointed by Governor and Council in December 2015. Philip has worked in many different Queensland Government roles and in private practice during his career. Prior to his appointment as Privacy Commissioner, he was Executive Director Small Business in the Queensland Department of Tourism, Major Events, Small Business and Commonwealth Games. He has also held high-level policy roles within the Queensland Government. As noted by the Attorney General, Philip holds a sp strong interest in this area, having majored within his Master's degree in Law and Technology Law, and focused on policy developments surrounding intellectual property, privacy and commercialisation, information technology and regulation of the internet and media. This morning, the Privacy Commissioner will speak about future challenges and opportunities across the information privacy landscape in, landscape in Queensland, including the privacy implications for agencies in adopting emerging technologies. I welcome Philip Green. Wow, I don't know, I almost have nothing more to say. It's all been said, but um, thank you, Attorney General and um, Minister for Justice, and thank you, Rachel, for your kind words. Um, it's really, really um, an honour to be standing here today. Um, and I'd really like to welcome my fellow commissioners, distinguished guests, colleagues and practitioners to my first Privacy Awareness Week. Um, as the attorneys pointed out, it's an initiative that's been going on across the Asia Pacific for the last nine years. But um, I think we're getting stronger and stronger. And every day I open my um, emails up and see new headlines on privacy related issues the French debating about whether children should be um, suing adults over Facebook postings. Um, the Panama documents all went online yesterday and searchable. Um, and I, I had to, even, even though this is probably not particularly um, private, but I had to check my suburb to see who was there. And interestingly enough, Yoronga has um, hits. So it, it's just a demonstration of the challenges we're facing. Um, I've been meeting um, regularly with our Chief Information Officer on the ICT side, Andrew Mills, and it's great to see you here as well, Andrew. Um, it's a significant challenge, the data security um, matters that we face from a law enforcement perspective as well as from a privacy perspective. And getting the balance right is a critical thing, and it's great to see a, a group of multidisciplinary um, individuals across the board that are joining us here this morning. Um, as far as um, the interesting things that are happening across um, the events this week, New South Wales kicked their week off last, last week with an interesting address by the former Justice and Honourable Michael Kirby on a tour to privacy. New South Wales Parliament has been considering that. Um, ACT has actually just announced they're going to consider it. I'm not advocating that today, um, but I think it's great opportunity with the reviews coming forward that we can have some public debate on those issues. Um, the review of our act is timely too. Since 2009, a lot has happened. Um, back, back then, um, Facebook wasn't really in existence or early days. Um, now we've got 14 million users in Australia. Um, and Shara is gonna speak later about some of the other challenges and particularly the multidisciplinary approach that we need. Um, privacy is one of the matters and one of the rights to be um, debated in this and to, to get the balance right. But 
many other ethical and moral issues are going to come up. Um, as the chief um, of the Telstra's chief information and security head, Mike Burgess, points out, um, data security and privacy are not just about um, the ICT guys or the privacy guys. CEOs down in their, in their organizations need to manage privacy and security as a business risk. Information management is critical. It's one of our key assets in government and in business. And that goes down to the very low, um, lowest of employees. If you don't have a culture, um, we speak about the three C's in privacy and in data security. Um, the code, which is the weaknesses in, in coding and in, in the platforms. The communications, so the interception of the data. Um, at the and that goes back as far as you know, the old horse and carriage when the mail got intercepted. It's not a new issue. But the culture is the most critical. So this year's privacy awareness theme, privacy in your hands, is particularly opposite. Um, and everyone in an organization, in government particularly, um, has a obligation. And that, that's beyond our mere act. There's ethical obligations about confidentiality and privacy as well. Um, the attorney actually touched on a point that I'd like to make as a hallmark of my tenure, and that's privacy by design. Um, the Office of Information Commission has had a strong record of collaboration and working on policy and on new projects and ICT um, processes to make sure that privacy is built in and in integral. It's a lot easier to deal with these matters up front before costs are outlaid, and often privacy um, respectful solutions can be um, included in projects without any additional cost, um, simply by thinking of it in advance. One of the matters we're consulting on nationally at the moment is um, facial recognition, biometric capability. Um, now that, that sounds particularly scary, but there's matters that can be worked through to get the balance right. Um, the um, CCTV report, or the follow-up report that we've just published has shown, as Rachel's pointed out, the vast amount of data um, from a video perspective that's being collected by agencies. And managing that, I think, is going to be a key, key issue for government agencies and the businesses that collect it. The security of that and the access. Um, our report showed last year there were 4,000 applications for access to that footage. That's an, a tremendous task and a tremendous um, amount of resources dedicated to providing access. So we do need to think these things through, how long we store that data, particularly even the archivists, if it's been accessed and it's being used for evidence for something, then there's a permanent record that needs to be kept or maybe need to be kept. Um, I'm not going to stand in the way <laughs> of Shara because you all come to see her. Today prevent, presents an opportunity to further that, the discussion and maybe to, to think about it and plant some foundations for the review of our office and of our legislation. Shara is an internationally respected cutting edge technology futurist, um, innovation strategist and telecoms expert with a passion for helping businesses use technology to do things better. And we in government are always about that. We have a customer focus attitude. So with that in mind, I introduce to you and please join me in welcoming to Queensland, Ms. Shara Evans. Thank you, Phil, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You know, it's a delight to be here, and especially to hear the addresses this morning from the Queensland Attorney General, Information Commissioner, and Privacy Commissioner. I really like that you're so switched on about the intersection of privacy and technology and how it's going to unfold in the future. As a futurist, I spend a lot of my time going into research labs to see what they're working on and where things are going to be over the next 10 years and beyond. And I spend a lot of time talking to these researchers and innovators at startups in lots of different places around the world. Without a doubt, there are an amazing array of technologies that are coming online right now that are going to create a world in 10 years that may be unrecognizable and in 20 years may seem straight out of a science fiction movie. These technologies are going to completely disrupt industries like transport, logistics, agriculture, manufacturing. Almost any industry that you can think of is going to be disrupted. 
But along the way, these same technologies have very, very clear security and privacy implications. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. And to do this, I'm going to weave you in and out of the here and now and the future, share some things that I'm concerned about in the here and now and where this may go over the coming 10 years and beyond. Right now, if I were to describe security and privacy, I would say we are in a state of ongoing war. Every single day, I read of some other hack. Last week, it was Gumtree. There was also a Minecraft hack in the United States. And there were reports that are not substantiated yet that up to 270 million email addresses and names were compromised, including from big social media companies like Gmail, Yahoo, Hotmail. Just yesterday, the scuttlebutt was that this may have been a false alarm and that this may have been really old data with old passwords. It's yet to play out. But it doesn't matter what day of the week it is, there's always something new that is alarming that comes across my desk. Today, the biggest attack vector is still through computer networks. But mobile phones and other devices like wearables are coming up next. Just out of curiosity, how many in the room are using iOS for your device? Just raise your hands. How many are using Android? Fewer, but still some of you. Well, let me share a little bit about the world of mobile applications. The apps that are on our smartphones are not always what they seem, and Android is particularly susceptible. A classic example of an app that does things it shouldn't is this brightest, brightest flashlight free app. Over 50 million people downloaded it and didn't realize that this flashlight was actually spying on their every move and reporting it back to advertisers. Then there's this um, game called Flappy Birds, right? There are about 300 clones of this on Android, and 79% of those applications contain malware, many of them which let you get at the root access to that mobile phone. That means they can get to any application and any data on your phone. We're seeing more and more mobile banking. How many of you do banking with your phone? Right? Quite a few of you. You might want to be using Apple Pay at some point. You know, if you have these applications on there and you've got malware that's got root access, guess what the cyber criminals can get up to? And then at the end of last year, one that really got me worried came out, and it's called the Ace Card Trojan. And this runs on Android, and what it does is it masquerades on top of legitimate applications like banking applications, like Twitter, like Skype, like PayPal, and you're entering this information thinking that you're working with an application that you know, but it's really going off to cyber criminals. It's a big worry. iOS isn't immune either. There's an application um, or a malware that infects your computer and from there travels up the cord when you sync your phone. It's called Wire Lurker. You know, there's so many of these things that we really do need to be very diligent about the stuff that we have on our phones, the kind of information that we have, and who's tracking us, who's siphoning off our contact lists or doing other things that are perhaps even much more nefarious. Now, one of the other things that I've read very recently is a study out of the United States that talked about how healthcare professionals use their mobile phones. And as it turns out, about 80% of healthcare professionals use their mobile phones in some way, shape, or form connected to their patients. What they also found in this study, and this is US-centric, but there are obvious analogies here, is that 27 million people who had Android also had a healthcare app on their phone, and there was an Android malware um, infection on that phone. That's a lot. 
one of the other things that came out of the study that I was really dismayed to hear was that 48% of the people interviewed didn't even use a password or a touch ID on their mobile phone. So that wasn't limited just to health professionals, but if you think about it, if you've got roughly half the population not even putting in basic protection on their phone, what kind of security is there? So with medical professionals, the thing that's scary there is that they've got your information and my information, and they're sharing it, but they may be exposed to malware or they may not even have passwords. So we really do need to start paying attention to who else's data we have on our phone in addition to our own. And then we get to this whole um, idea of protecting our children. And Rachel, you mentioned that in your comments, um, and so did the Attorney General. We need to protect our children, but at what cost? There's an application that I was looking at called TeenSafe. And what this does is it secretly allows a parent to monitor the stuff on a child's phone. So if you wanted to install it on iOS, all you need is their Apple ID and password. And it allows you to look at all their text, even things that were deleted. It allows you to see a phone log of who they might have called, track their location, all of that. You might argue, well, as a parent, I want to be able to do that. But what if somebody other than the parent has that kind of application? What if your child has shared their password or their Apple ID and let someone else do that? Who might be tracking your child in everything that they do? Or what if it's not being used to spy Really, that's what it is, spy on a child. What if it's a spouse or a partner or a coworker wanting to use this kind of application too? Now, you sign up to it and you pay a monthly fee and you probably have a click wrap terms of agreement, but who's to say that somebody isn't going to lie and track someone that they should not be tracking? I find it kind of creepy, almost as creepy as the connected Barbie doll. Has anyone heard about that? It's a Barbie doll that records what your child is saying. It's connected to the internet, and it uses artificial intelligence, and it plays back stuff to your child based on what she or he may have said. And then as a parent, you can get daily email recordings or weekly email recordings. But it also says in the click wrap terms that it may be used for other purposes. Right? So here you've got this toy, and it, you know, who knows what the Barbie's going to say, right? You know, they may be doing advertising or something else. Or, you know, kids have very vivid imaginations. What if your child says something, you know, just in play? You know, it's fantasy. And five years from now, it's out there in the public domain, and it's used to embarrass them or bully them or do something else. You know, we have to really think about what we're doing with these technologies. Then we have a big scuffle that happened a few months ago of the Apple um, versus FBI, where FBI in the United States had an iPhone purportedly from a terrorist um, at the San Bernardino event in December. It was an unfortunate incident. Some people died, and the FBI couldn't get into the phone because of the security on the iOS. And they essentially sued Apple and wanted Apple to put in what would amount to be a backdoor for people to be able to use brute force hacking to get into an iPhone. The problem is that once it's there, who's to say it's only law enforcement in a very serious case that would use it? Couldn't cyber hackers use it as well? Or what about scope creep? What I was surprised about in this whole debate, that one of the people who came out and said, this is a really, really bad idea, is a retired General Michael Hayden, who's the former head of the NSA and the CIA, and he said, backdoors, in general, are a very bad idea because once it's there, you don't know who else is going to use it. And in fact, once hackers know that it's out there, they will very specifically try to go in and break it. Now, as it turned out, the lawsuit was, dra was dropped. Apple found a third-party firm that was able to hack into it. Um, 
they have not disclosed exactly how it was done, but Scuttlebutt in the security industry says that they probably made copies of this um, drive that's sitting inside the Apple and just used brute force and then created a new copy once it locked up. But you need very, very specialized equipment to do that, and of course you need the phone. But these are things that we have to consider. And then we have social media. And, you know, there's this old saying that says there's no such thing as a free lunch. And when it comes to social media, that is so true. We're leaving these digital footprints that capture our lives. A study by Respect Network in the United States showed that with Facebook, um, if you've got 10 likes on there, Facebook believes that they know you better than a coworker. If you like 150 things, they know you better than a family member, and 300, they know you better than your spouse. That's a little bit scary, right? And then think about services like Google. How much information are you putting out there if you're using Gmail, Google Hangouts, you know, you've got an Android phone, you've got all these applications that you're using for free. What if someone were to hack into your account? How much would they know about you? You know, are we compromising our safety and security by using all these free services and what if there was a master hack and they got lots and lots of records from a lot of people? There are some really serious concerns. But in the future, it may go even further than that. There's a movement called the transhumanist movement where basically a bunch of people want to live forever, right? They want to be able to take their minds and upload it into a computer with all of their memories and associations and pictures and all sorts of stuff, eventually be able to upload it into a robot, and then beyond that, perhaps upload it into some sort of living organism, maybe a clone of a human. So they've got this design that says, how can we take our mind files and create a life beyond our physical living life. Now there's an interim step, and that is to create these mind files which mimic living people combined with AI to be able to do this kind of emulated personality. One example is this little mini robot called Bina48, who's modeled after a lady by the name of Bina Rothblatt, who's still living, and you can literally have conversations with Bina, and it has her personality emulated. It's really quite a fascinating development. And in fact, there was a storyline on a TV show called Limitless that used this kind of approximation with this little robot there to help them solve her murder. They queried her robot bust, including her mind file, and figured out who her killer was. What I see right now as the biggest issue when it comes to privacy and security are data breaches. And in particular, identity theft is one that I really worry about. Understand that when there is a privacy breach, it's not just individuals who are impacted, it's businesses too, and it's very expensive. In fact, the more regulated an industry is, the more expensive it is on a per-record basis. But it's more than just money. Let me give you an idea of fallout. About two years ago, Target was hacked. 110 million records were compromised, including about 40 million attached to credit cards. The CEO was sacked. The cost is estimated to be out about a billion dollars US. It impacted the company's reputation to the point that in the quarter immediately following the hack, profits dropped by 46%. So as a company director, you need to be really worried about privacy and security too because it will impact your bottom line. Here's another classic example of a hack that has impacted a company as well as individuals, and that's the Ashley Madison hack. Ashley Madison is a website, or was a website, for adulterers. Once they were hacked, people's lives were destroyed. Now, admittedly, 
people shouldn't have been cheating like that, but a lot of people had marriages fail specifically because of this. The company is likely to go out of existence, and it's even worse than that. The CEO was sacked pretty much right away, but in investigating this hack, they found that the company was engaging in deceptive practices. With about 34 million users, only about 15% were women, and a lot of those profiles were inactive. So they're likely to have charges filed against them for deceptive conduct, and they found that the former CTO had hacked into a competitor's website as well. So the ramifications are going to be ongoing, and it's estimated that it will cost about 850 million US all up. That's big dollars. And then there was another huge hack um, a little while ago, less than a year, at the Office of Personnel Management in the United States. So this is the US office that does the security vetting for spooks and for others who have very sensitive access to all kinds of information. And because of the nature of what these people are doing, this office was collecting everything you can imagine about you as a person and your family, your date and place of birth, everybody that you've ever had contacted with, the people that you've traveled with, the places that you've gone, your social security number, and your fingerprints. Now, imagine that you're a spy with this database hacked. You can never be a secret agent if they can get to your fingerprints. What are you going to do? Burn off your fingers? You know, you know, what if you can imagine never being able to use Touch ID on a smart device? Now, these things are happening, and this was a secure agency. And by the way, the head of the agency lost her job over this as well. So I worry about this stuff a lot. So then, you know, in the mix of all this, we have what we're doing in Australia, and we passed the data retention legislation last year, uh, last year, and that's basically compelling telcos and ISPs to retain for a period of two years metadata, which basically tracks, you know, your phone calls, the websites you visit, all kinds of information. The cost to the telecommunications industry is huge, and one of the reasons is that they have to integrate these disparate databases into a central repository. Now, in the security world, one of the best ways to prevent being hacked is to actually have separate databases, but yet we're doing the opposite. One of the things that is likely to be an unintended fallout of this is that a lot of small ISPs, because of this cost and not knowing what will be reimbursed and a lot of it not being reimbursed, will actually be forced out of business. But it goes beyond this. You know, it was sold to the public on the basis of security. We want to prevent terrorism. But the organizations that are getting access to this without a warrant um, are companies like WorkSafe Victoria. You know, it's worker compensation and safety, or the racing commissioner, or the Civil Aviation Authority. Now, I'm sorry, I can understand that there may be legitimate law enforcement reasons to get information, but without a warrant? You know, what happens if one of these telcos are hacked? You're looking at a lot of very, very private information that could be used against people, and there are real costs to this. And there's scope creep. And then we have the latest, how shall I say, I'll call it stupidity, because that's what I think it is. And that is by the ABS, an organization that I respect immensely, except in this instance. They want to retain your name and address and store it with your census answers. They're creating a honeypot for hackers of all kinds of information that can be used for identity fraud. And if they think that it can't be hacked, I think they're fooling themselves. If the US Office of Personnel Management can be hacked, why can't the ABS be hacked? And frankly, a lot of cybercrime is creating is done from the inside. It's not just hackers. If there's a lot of money attached, couldn't somebody be corrupted? I think that we're putting the integrity of census data at risk if people try to protect their privacy. Is this the end of the cash world? You know, we're putting more and more on our digital wallets, and Australia is one of the leading organizations, right, or leading countries to do this. 
With cash, we have anonymity. With everything recorded on credit cards or FPAS statements, there is no such thing as a private transaction. And then we have cryptocurrency, and of course that's um, something that governments are worried about too. So let's take a quick step into the future on some of the emerging technologies and where this is going to go over the coming 10 years. I talked about wearables, and one of the trends in the enterprise space is to be able to take biometric data that is tracked by wearables and use it to do things like maintain the safety of employees. There's an experimental um, wearable that not only tracks things like your heart rate and your pulse and other um, easily obtained biometrics, it's able to do molecular analysis and track what's in your sweat. So a few weeks ago, I was talking to a group of CEOs about the use of wearables, and this discussion came up about, well, can I actually force an employee to wear a wearable? And my view is that if it's not in their employment contract, no, but will employment contracts of the future include that? And what if it's used not just to help with safety, but to make decisions about hiring or firing? You know, there'll be a time when our smart clothing is able to be used, for instance, in a call center to sense when somebody's getting flustered. You know, is that something that we want to do in a workplace? And what are the implications? And of course, a lot of these devices don't even have security affiliated with them. And what happens if this data becomes corrupted? You may find as an organization that your big data pool that you're relying on is a corrupt data pool. Then there's a technology called augmented reality, and basically what that is is a contextual overlay on the things you see. So a few years back, you probably would have heard of Google Glasses. Some of the newer eyewear are from companies like Meta, the Meta 2, or the Microsoft HoloLens, or this Daiquiri Smart Helmet, where they're being used in an enterprise situation, let's say, to look at a range of pipes and have a view of what's in the pipe and how hot it is and which way you should turn the knob. Really interesting stuff, but these smart eyewear have lots of glasses so that there's two-way dialogues. So as we're starting to record things, not just from CCTV cameras, but from the eyewear that we wear, there are other obvious privacy implications as well. And then we have facial recognition. And as discussed earlier today, CCTV cameras are becoming more and more pervasive. And there's a couple kinds of facial recognition. One that you're familiar with probably as you go through customs is what you would call cooperative recognition, where you've got a picture of you and you're standing in front of a camera and it's best lighting possible and they're just trying to do a match. They're not actually looking at other databases to see if you might be a terrorist or a criminal. And even with that, there's a 20% failure rate. In fact, it never works with me. Don't know why, 100% failure rate. It goes beyond that there. A researcher um, here at QUT who has a company called Imagist Technology, Brian Lovell, has designed algorithms that allow you to detect faces in a crowd at an angle from CCTV. And it goes beyond that too. So it's not just recognizing individual faces, it's being able to look at emotions and being able to classify genders um, and reactions to things like advertising. But what if a facial database was hacked? You know, one of the problems with these facial recognition databases is that the bigger the database, the more pictures you have, the greater the chance there is of false recognition. And not only that, but what if somebody takes a picture of criminals and sticks your picture in there instead, and suddenly you're being targeted and harassed because you're thought to be a criminal? You have to suddenly prove that you're not who this facial recognition database is. It gets a bit crazy. In about seven years' time, it's going to get even crazier. One of the things that the technology industry is working on are smart glasses. And this is an example of a patent from Google where the eyewear that you'll wear will probably, at, by the time this comes out, most certainly, the opaque bits will be completely translucent. You know, so you'll have these contacts in your eye and you'll be able to blink twice and start taking a picture or a video 
just with your eyes. And not only that, but it will combine biotech too. So you'll be able to have things like auto-focusing lenses, you know, so no more reading glasses. You'll be able to detect all kinds of medical situations from the information in your tears. So there'll be good reasons for people to adopt that. Put this together with facial recognition and, you know, imagine going into a room like this and seeing everybody's name pop up, you know. <laughs> That's where we're going to be in about seven to ten years. And then we have flying robots and drones. And more and more, we're going to see them in our skies. In fact, we're probably in 10 years' time going to see drone highways you know, out the window here. They're loaded up with cameras, and they can do all kinds of things. And there are lots of legitimate reasons to use them, but they can also be used for spying and surveillance. Last week I was at CBIT and I was talking to one of the vendors um, of drone technology and they're getting quieter too, right? Uh, drone that has a high definition camera and a separate infrared camera would sell for about $3,200. You know, they're getting cheaper and cheaper all the time and they're getting smaller. Military organizations like the U.S. Air Force are working on these little tiny, teeny drones that look like insects. If this was perched on a shelf in your board meeting, would you know that it's there or in your house? You know, who knows who might have access to this kind of technology? So will we have any privacy in 10 years' time? And, you know, sometimes I worry, ooh, I think it might have already missed the boat. I hope not. But so many times, security and privacy is an afterthought. And how we use technologies, the ethics of it, is an afterthought. Now, there's one new technology that seems straight out of science fiction that may protect us at some stage from ongoing surveillance cameras. And it's an invisibility shield. I mean, seriously, you know, have you ever wanted to be invisible? This came out in a scientific journal just a few weeks ago, and what scientists at Iowa State University are doing is they have this liquid metal called Galenstad that's got a slightly open loop, and it's embedded in a silicon mesh, and it's able to be tuned to block out radar signals. So you can imagine that there are some real good application for wanting to not show up on radar. But where they are intending to go with this is to be able to take the frequency higher and be able to block out infrared light or visible light. So imagine sometime in the future, you're wearing clothes that have these little alloys as part of them, and you don't show up on cameras. Or, you know, maybe you have makeup, and, you know, therefore your face doesn't show up either. You know, that might be a really interesting technology. Then people will have to think about, hmm, what about all these CCTV cameras? You know, what are we going to do with these things? I think we're at least 10 years away from any kind of commercial application. I'm sure it will be used in military and security applications before you see it in the general public. But where does it go even beyond there? And this is where it gets a little bit spooky, sci-fi, scary. One of the world's leading futurists, Ray Kurzweil, has predicted that in the 2030s, we will have these little nanobots that go directly into our brain. They'll be made out of DNA. They'll, con they'll connect directly to our neocortex and allow us to do things like think a question and Google it, you know, just from your brain. Or you want to send an email to someone or communicate with someone, and you just send it brain to brain. You have a complex problem where you need more computing power. No problem. Fire it up like an Amazon web server, and suddenly you've got 10,000 times the computing power that you have in your natural human brain. Or you want to record every single one of your life memories, everything that you see and do. No problem. Store it in the cloud. Is this science fiction? Well, there's a lot of work happening in the world of nanotechnology and in very, very, very tiny robots. What we don't know yet is exactly how the human brain works. 
enough to be able to do that. Will we solve it in 15 years or 20 years? Maybe, maybe not, but at some point we will. Once you have the internet connections literally in your brain, will we have any privacy at all? What if everything that we think and do is someday stored in the cloud? And what if somebody hacks your brain? You know, <laughs> if you've got a computer and you've got a backup, you can wipe it. But what are you going to do? Wipe your brain? You know, these are the places where technology is going. And it's just so important that we have these discussions on security and privacy and ethics now while the technology is still being thought about and hasn't been deployed yet. And so many times I see in technologies, both in the here and now and in the emerging path, that security is an afterthought, that privacy is an afterthought, that ethics are not even considered. I mean, think about things like smartwatches. There was a study done last year where half of them don't even have basic pin protection built in. That's nuts. Why would you build a product you know, in 2015, 2016 without basic security? But we continue to do that. So these discussions that we're having here today are so important. And as we ponder these issues, we really need to look at the big picture. And that is, what kind of a world do we want to live in? Do we want to live in a world where everybody knows everything about us and maybe it can be used to hurt us or hurt our family? Or do we want to live in a world where privacy is part of our lives, where we still have a chance to have some things that we choose not to share with the rest of the world, not because they're illegal, but just because they're personal to us or to our families? Thank you so much, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the proceedings. I think everyone would agree that Shara has provided a thought-provoking presentation this morning that gives us all much to consider in terms of our use of technology in the near and not too distant future. As we have said today, an important component of our officer's work in privacy is assisting agencies to consider privacy implications and options regarding emerging technology to realise good outcomes to, that meet government objectives including privacy obligations and good practices. As discussed earlier, good privacy practices instill confidence and improve trust in an organisation within the community. Trust is not only important in terms of transparent, open and accountable government, but critical to the adoption of digital service delivery in particular, and therefore has implications for return on investment in such projects. Before we close proceedings for this morning, I would like to thank our wonderful staff at the Office of the Information Commissioner for their professionalism and expertise in ensuring not only the success of this event, but Privacy Awareness Week and our whole series of activities throughout the year. I would also like to express my appreciation for the Attorney General who has just had to leave us for a, a meeting this morning for attending and speaking, and the Privacy Commissioner, you all for attending and sharing in this event and please join with me in also thanking our keynote speaker for this morning, Ms Shara Evans. Thank you.